Gentlemen of the media, welcome to our post cabinet brief for Thursday, May 18th, 2017. This morning, the brief will be given by Honorable Joseph Harmon, Minister of State. Mr. Harmon. Thank you, Mr. Archer. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen of the media. Uh, this post cabinet press briefing will cover the matters that were dealt with at Cabinet at its last meeting on Tuesday, um, and basically the issues which were dealt with um, are as follows. Uh, firstly, His Excellency President David Granger advised Cabinet of his acceptance of an invitation from His Highness Salman bin Abdulaziz Al Swad, the, the King of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia to participate in the Arab, Arab Islamic American Summit, which will be held in the King Abdulaziz Convention Center in the city of Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, on May 21st, 2017. The summit will bring together leaders of the world's Islamic nations and invited heads of states to address ways of building more robust and effective security partnerships to counter and prevent the growing threat of terrorism and violent extremism around the globe through promoting tolerance and moderation. The President of the United States, Mr. Donald Trump, is also expected to attend the summit. His Excellency, the President's delegation will include Vice President and Honorable Minister of Foreign Affairs, Mr. Carl Greenwich, the Director General of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Ms. Audrey Waddle, Mr. Sheraz Mohammed, the First Secretary of the Ghana Permanent Mission to United Nations, and Mr. Moenul Haq, Director of Education, the Central Islamic Organization of Guyana. To facilitate His Excellency's, uh, His Excellency President Granger and his delegation's attendance, the government of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia will be providing air transport to and from the conference, um, hotel accommodation, meals, and internal transport within the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Cabinet approved the appointment of persons to the following offices, the office of the Ombudsman and the offices of the Public Service Appellate Tribunal. The persons appointed were retired Justice Winston Patterson as the Ombudsman and the Public Service Appellate Tribunal Retired Justice of Appeal Nandram Kisun as the chairperson, Mrs. Abiola Wong Innes, attorney at law as member, and Mr. Winston Brown, a former Deputy Permanent Secretary, as member. It is noted that the Public Service Appellate Tribunal was inactive for over two decades, and what that meant was that public servants who felt wronged about any administrative decisions that were made against them had to resort to filing actions in the High Court. The Honorable Minister of Communities presented the Cabinet the audited financial statements for 2014 and 2015 for the Central Housing and Planning Authority as part of the administration's program to establish transparent and accountable governance. Cabinet accepted the statements and approved they are being laid in the National Assembly as required by law. Cabinet has approved the appointment of the Board of Directors of the Ghana National Newspapers Limited for the period June 1st, 2017 to May 31st, 2018. The directors who are appointed are Mrs. Gita Chandan Edmund as chairperson, Mr. Bert Wilkinson, Mr. Aaron Fraser, Mrs. Karen Davis, Mr. Hakim Khan, Mr. Ruel Johnson, Mr. Sherrod Duncan, 
Mrs. Tabita Sarbo Halley, and Mr. Hilbert Foster. Cabinet approved the request of the State of Qatar for the appointment of His Excellency Mohammed Ahmad M. H. Al Haki as its non resident ambassador to Guyana. Ambassador Al Haki will be resident in Brazil. Guyana and Qatar established diplomatic relations in August of 1996 and have been engaged at the multilateral level at the United Nations and the Organization of Islamic Cooperation. The appointment of Ambassador Al Haki will provide an opportunity for enhanced relations between our two states. Cabinet approved the attendance of the first Vice President and Honorable Prime Minister and Mr. Sita Nagamotu at the 100th anniversary festival of the end of Indian indentureship to be held in Capsitea Bell, Guadeloupe from May 19th to the 22nd, 2017. The festival will be hosted by the Guadeloupe chapter of the Global Organization of People of Indian Origin with the objective of sharing with the Caribbean the multicultural heritage of Guadeloupe and the French West Indies. The Honorable Prime Minister and Mrs. Nagamoto have been invited as honored guests to promote friendly relations between Guadeloupe and Guyana. During the temporary absence from the country of His Excellency the President and the Prime Minister, the Vice President Kemal Dramjitan will be performing the functions of the office of the President. Cabinet has approved attendance of the Honorable Attorney General and Minister of Legal Affairs at the Caribbean Financial Action Task Force Steering Group meeting to be held in Port of Spain, Trinidad and Tobago from the 28th of May to the 1st of June, 2017. The Honorable Attorney General, who is the Deputy Chairman of the Caribbean Financial Action Task Force, will co-host the meeting. The meeting will deal with important matters leading up to the final plenary session that will be hosted by Guyana in November 2017, at which the Honorable Attorney General will assume chairmanship of the task force. Mrs. Tessa Odkirk of the Attorney General's Chamber will also attend the meeting. Cabinet has accepted an invitation for the government of Guyana to participate in the Commonwealth Health Minister's meeting and the 70th World Assembly scheduled to be held on May 21st, 2017 and May 22nd, respectively, in Geneva, Switzerland. The Commonwealth Health Minister's meeting will address global security challenges in efforts to reduce all forms of violence, including family violence. The 70th World Assembly will discuss the use of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development as a stimulus to build better systems for sustainable development and an opportunity to build better systems for health and well-being through links to other systems such as agriculture, education, and the environment. The Ghana delegation will comprise the Honorable Minister of Public Health, Mrs. Wally Lawrence, and Dr. Shamdio Prasad, the Chief Medical Officer. Guyana will participate in the fifth Global Platform for Disaster Risk Reduction to be held in Cancun, Mexico from May 24th to the 26th, 2017. The platform is aimed at uh, the following objectives, to increase public awareness that natural technology and environmental hazards pose to modern societies, the reduction of economic and social losses of disaster as measured and the commitment by public authorities to the reduction of risks. 
His Excellency Riyad Insanali, Ambassador to the OAS, and Colonel Ramsarup, Director General of the Civil Defense Commission, will attend the platform and represent Guyana. Cabinet has approved the attendance of several meetings of the institutions and agencies of the Caribbean Development Bank to be held in Provinciales, Turks and Caicos Island from May 21st to the 26th, 2017. Those meetings are the 276th meeting of the bank's board of directors, the 34th meeting of the contributors of the Special Development Fund, the 47th meeting of the Bank Board of Governors and a one-day retreat for the Bank's governors and directors. These meetings will take decisions concerning loans, guarantees and investments by the CDB, technical assistance on other operations of the Bank, borrowing terms of the Special Development Fund and it will make pronouncements on bank-related policy matters. Mr. Tarchan Balgobin, Director of the Project Cycle Management Division, and Mr. Sherian Isaacs, Head of the Multilateral Financial Institutions Division, both of the Ministry of Finance, will attend the meeting and represent Guyana. Cabinet has approved Guyana's participation in a meeting of the Asset Recovery Interagency Network for the Caribbean region to be held in Miami, United States of America from June 28 to the 29, 2017. The Department Against Transnational Organized Crime of the Secretariat for Multidimensional Security and the Organization of American States will host the meeting. The participants will discuss a proposal by a group of experts to establish an asset recovery interagency network for the wider Caribbean region to enhance international cooperation both within the region and asset recovery interagency networks worldwide. Mr. Sidney James, head of the Special Organized Crime Unit, will attend this meeting. Cabinet has approved the participation in the Medellin Lab Inclusive Safe and Resilient Cities to be hosted by the World Bank USAID and the City of Medellin in Medellin, Colombia from May 29 to June 2, 2017. The event will bring together policymakers, practitioners, and researchers to exchange best practices, explore innovations, and discuss common challenges in multi-sector approaches to reduce urban violence and promote secure coexistence. Superintendent Robert Tyndall of the Special Organized Crime Unit will attend the event. Cabinet has approved the attendance of the Vice President and Honorable Minister of the Indigenous Peoples Affairs at the Seminar on Indigenous Peoples Issues in the Amazon and surrounding regions to be held at the Stanford University in California, United States of America from May 22nd to the 26th. The seminar is to enlighten the university and the California community about Indigenous Peoples Issues in the Amazon and surrounding regions. In attendance will be Indigenous leaders from other Amazonian countries, and it's expected that the seminar will create a network for continued shared experiences. Cabinet has given its assent to participation in this event um, by the Honorable Vice President, Mr. Sidney Alicock. Guyana will participate in a 2017 Forum in Ottawa, Canada on May 21st, 2017. This event is hosted by the Guyana High Commission in Ottawa, the Guyana Consulate in Toronto, and the Guyana Diaspora Organization in collaboration with the City of Ottawa under the umbrella 
Ottawa welcomed the world's calendar of activities where embassies and high commissions in Ottawa are invited and assisted to mark their national days with a series of first-class cultural events. This event will feature cultural and interactive activities, commercial and tourism displays, and Guyanese cuisine. Its Torama Culture Group of Region 9 will participate in the event. Guyana will participate in the Dalian University of Foreign Language annual summer camp in Dalian and Beijing City from May, as in China, from May 30th to June 19, 2017. Participation in the camp will be part of an ongoing program of cooperation between the Dalian University of China and the University of Guyana to provide Chinese language training the Guyanese, a part of which is a certification course in Chinese language and culture for public service officials. Mrs. Sherian Charmaine Barram, Foreign Service Officer 2, and Mrs. Giovanni Fletcher, Clark 2 General, both of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, will attend the camp. Cabinet has noted the award of contracts by the procurement entities and the National Procurement and Tender Administration Board as follows. For the construction and rehabilitation of roads in region number three, lot number four, Greenwich Park Main Road, a contract in the sum of 25 million three hundred and thirty-eight thousand two hundred and thirty dollars awarded to R and B Investment Inc. Lot five Old Road, the Kindren, a contract in the sum of $31,776,000, awarded the Court Ben Contracting Services Limited. To the Burisiri Housing Scheme Road, also known as GDF Housing Scheme, for the sum of $12,937,000, a contract awarded to Excel Engineering. Lot 7, Fisher Dam, Zealot, for the sum of $27,583,000, contract awarded to CompuStruct Engineering, Inc. For the construction and rehabilitation of miscellaneous roads in region number 4, uh, this is an uh, important roads that are we're going to announce here. Sideline Dam, good success, East Bank Demerara. Contract in the sum of nineteen million five hundred and ninety two thousand awarded to BK International Inc. The main access road at Hope on the East Bank of Demerara a contract in the sum of thirteen million nine hundred and thirty one thousand dollars to S. Jagmohan Hardware Supplies and Construction Services. The main access road to Hope on the East Bank of Damarara, this is lot number three, for the sum of 58,946,000, contract awarded to ANS General Contractors. Lot number four, Gas Station Street Eccles on the East Bank of Damarara. A contract in the sum of thirteen million four hundred and thirty-four thousand to KB and B contractors. Lot number five, Second Street, Good Success, East Bank Demerara. A contract in the sum of twenty-two million four hundred and ninety-three thousand to S. Jagmohan Hardware Supplies and Construction Services. Lot number six, Fifth Street, Caneville, East Bank Demerara. Contract in the sum of twenty-five million four hundred and sixty-five thousand awarded to BK International Inc. Lot number seven, Second Street, Fort Field, Caneville, East Bank Demerara. Contract in the sum of twenty-four million six hundred and twenty-seven thousand to Excel Engineering. To the Oil Mill Road. Coven John East Coast Demerara, a contract in the sum of twenty-two million 
$262,500 to ANS Contractors Inc. And to these other contracts on the East Coast, I can say that uh, at one of our recent outreaches at Monrepo, the residents actually complained about the condition of these roads. And um, a delegation also came to see me yesterday about these roads. So I want to make sure that they are listening very carefully. So these roads are being, contracts have been awarded for them. Lot number nine, Middle Street. Melanie Damishana, East Coast Demerara. Contract in the sum of $18,450,000. Awarded to Shiraz Bacchus General Contractors. Block 8, Road Network. Now, this Block 8 is a housing scheme that had been developed under the previous administration. And the infrastructure work had not been done, so people were built their houses, the roads were in bad shape, the lights, water, and all of these issues arose when uh, we had one of our outreaches in Monrepo. And I'm sure they'll be pleased to hear that the roads in Block 8, the entire network of roads, not uh, Monrepo East Coast Demerara, contracting sum of $30,845,000, awarded to Guy America Construction Inc. The last street, Block A, Triumph, East Coast Demerara, he contracting a sum of $27,776,000 to Barden Construction. Graham Street Pleasants, East Coast Demerara, contracting a sum of $22,651,000 to Sherrod Bacchus, general contractor. Beirut Continuation Road, Phase 2, East Coast Demerara, contracting a sum of $19,108,000, awarded to Associated Construction Services. Better for Wachtin Main Road, Phase 1, East Coast Demerara. A contract in the sum of $60,964,000 to S. Jagmohan Hardware Supplies and Construction Service. Colgin Gen Main Road, the main access road, East Coast Demerara. A contract in the sum of $58,315,000 to ANS General Contractors Inc. The first street, Earl's Court, LBI East Coast Demerara, contract in the sum of $25 million and $92,000 to Barden Construction. Second street, Garden of Eden, East Bank Demerara, contract in the sum of $77,921,000 awarded to Geico Construction and General Services. And lot number 18, Agriculture Road, Monrepo. It's a road that has been complained about all the time. East Coast Demerara. A contract in the sum of 59 million and 31,000 awarded to KP Thomas and Sons Contracting Inc. For the construction of urban roads in region number 10, the rehabilitation of the Teachers Hostel Road in Mackenzie, a contract in the sum of $21,496,000 awarded to Associated Construction Services. For the rehabilitation of the One Mile to Canva City Road, Wisma, a contract in the sum of $29,551,000 awarded the R and B investment. These twenty four contracts for a total award of seven hundred and forty nine million five hundred and eighty three thousand dollars for projects in regions three, four and ten are part of government's ongoing program to construct and or rehabilitate urban and miscellaneous roads in all communities across Guyana. This is also part of a greater commitment to enhance the infrastructure in rural and urban communities across the country 
so as to improve the quality of life of all our citizens. Contracts were awarded also for consul consultancy services to design and supervise work at lot number four, MOCA, which is the Rural Agricultural Development Ministry of Agriculture for the sum of $28,550,000 to SRK Engineering. For the supply of traffic signs and accessories, a contract in the sum of $447,597 United States dollars awarded the Dax Contracting Services. For the supply of crash cushions and barriers to the Ministry of Public Infrastructure, a contract in the sum of $453,084 United States dollars awarded the Dax Contracting Services. And for the supply of thermoplastic road marking and road making equipment and material, contract awarded to Christical South Africa in a sum of 284,514 United States dollars. Ladies and gentlemen, these are the matters that were dealt with the cabinet and at the um, our last meeting of the cabinet. So I now take your question. Push right up. Sure. Mr. Harbel, Danish Brown, you right. Sir, could you uh, tell us a bit more about the visit to Saudi Arabia, uh, whether there will be bilateral discussions, say, with the U.S. President, uh, what representation or issues will be raised on behalf of Guyana and CARICOM to both the Saudi officials as well as the U.S. President? Well, I, I cannot speak about the, uh, because as I said, this is a meeting of, of our leaders. Um, we do not have a specific agenda with respect to meetings with uh, the, our head of state and President Trump. But what I do know is that the issues in relation to the Islamic Development Bank and the loans and facilities that are available uh, to Guyana will be part of the, the engagements. Also, of course, the question of uh, the global threat uh, posed by terrorism and issues in that regard will also be dealt with. But with respect to any um, engagement specifically between His Excellency the President and Mr. Trump, I cannot speak to that. Can you confirm, sir, that the Guyana government is concerned about the slow pace and the delivery of promised assistance by the Islamic Development Bank? No, I would not say that we are, we are very concerned about it because there are processes which we, we knew had to be um, undertaken once we signed on to the bank and um, we became a member of the bank. Um, so it is not as if uh, we expected things to happen immediately and it didn't happen. These processes we are aware of, um, uh, Mr. Minister of Finance, uh, Mr. Jordan, is a member of the board of the bank and, and is basically representing Guyana's interest in a, sure, in a very aggressive way. Oh. Right up. Yeah. Um, talks with the Guyana Public Service Union. Um, I think you said budget had stalled then. Um, but Mr. Yard had said yesterday that we have received no signals from the government as to when these talks will resume. So can you give an update on that? And secondly, Minister, can you provide the government's position on decriminalization of marijuana, especially small amounts? All right, well, there are two things. One is that um, our commitment to the public service was to ensure that the terms and conditions of service, that is including wages, that we were going to address them. Um, yesterday, you saw the swearing, of, swearing in of the public service appellate tribunal. That tribunal is something that's been 
lapsed, had lapsed for over 20 years. And uh, several public servants who had issues, in fact, even issues in relation to the Public Service Commission on their promotions, appointments, terminations of service, had no other recourse other than going to the court. And uh, several of those matters have been left there, um, waiting to be heard, some are part heard. Some cases, um, judges would have actually left the bench. And so, setting up of this, this tribunal has been one of the important matters that we decided we have to address. So that was addressed. The other matters, of course, have to do with uh, public service, the conditions of service. And those matters are also being addressed. So what we are talking now about is a raft of measures that will increase or improve the quality of service of all public servants. Um, and those things we are addressing. Um, and we're not addressing them in a piecemeal manner. And I think uh, Mr. Yard would have said yesterday also, in his interview with you, that he was extremely pleased to see the actual realization of the establishment of the Public Service Appellate Tribunal at this time. And it is really a commitment which our government has given to the public servants and we're keeping that commitment. <clears throat> That's one. The other one had to do with Ganja. With, um, with Ganja. <laughs> well, I see the new Ganja man in town is, um, is talking about, about these matters. Um, but what is, is, what is important, I think, is that we have a, a more enlightened society. And therefore, statements that are made by some politicians at the press conferences, I need not respond to them here because the people are responding. I saw, I think, Mark Benchkop did a good piece on it and uh, somebody else wrote about it and so on. But with respect to decriminalization of, of marijuana, that is not a matter which is now engaging the immediate attention. What we have, we have a motion in the National Assembly by one of our members about sentencing, the sentencing policy with respect to, to marijuana. But as far as decriminalizing it, um, I think I made this point clear and I had to issue a statement to one of the newspapers who actually misrepresented what I said at a meeting at Dead Amstel a few weeks ago, where I addressed the issue of industrial hemp and the government's position with respect to the planting of industrial hemp. And the paper actually went on to say that what I said was that the government has no policy with respect to ganja, to marijuana, and the sentencing for marijuana. Two totally different issues altogether. So what I can say to you is that the question of sentencing is a matter for the judiciary to consider. The laws are there, and we believe that it is a matter which engaged the judiciary. It was one of the issues that had been raised um, after the last um, prison riots in the engagement between the judiciary and the executive. It was another a matter which was raised there, and the judiciary undertook to examine the matter. And that is as far as we are right now. Sir, so, so my pet peeve, you're spending a lot of money in the rural community doing a lot of roads. There are a series of contractors. Is there any way the government can keep tabs on the employment benefits and charge the recruitment of people? in the various communities to work to undertake these roads? And is there a deadline for their completion? Yes, in every one of the contracts, you will have um, a deadline for its completion. Um, what I can say to you is that while the contracts themselves expressly do not provide for the employment of local labor as a matter of policy, um, what we have done is require in all of these communities that the contractors that they make, that they, they take the availability of local labor into consideration in their employment practices. And this is intended, of course, to ensure that the communities also benefit from the monies that are spent in the communities um, by the award of these contracts. 
um, last year, and I think earlier this year, you'll see myself, Minister Patterson, and several other ministers um, going around to the various communities where these contracts were awarded and having meetings with the contractors and the community leaders and asking and requesting or requiring of them to ensure that the communities were, the communities were involved. It has two benefits. One is that apart from providing employment and economic activity in the community, it also helps the contractor with the security of the equipment in the communities themselves. And so this is what we have been doing. And uh, two weeks ago, I indicated that on some of the roads that we're doing in Region 1 and Region 8, that Minister Patterson would have been going out there with a team of persons from his ministry to ensure that these contracts that were awarded, that the communities were aware of them, that they were aware of the, the specs of these contracts, and so that they themselves can keep an eye on the contractor for quality and delivery. Okay. <laughs> Can you say uh, when the president will make a decision about the GCOM list? And is there a possibility of a third list being sought? And I have another question. Is government considering any action in relation to the proposed U.S. bill to tax remittances? And can you give us an update on the flooding in Region 8, please? Well, four things. Um, <laughs> First of all, let me give you an update on the flooding in Region 8. Um, we are aware of the flooding in Region 8. In fact, there are several villages. Um, and I, I just had a report just shortly before I came here from the Civil Defense Commission that's responsible for the question of uh, disaster and risk reduction matters in the state of Guyana. Um, the report was that at Kaibarupai, that is in the North Pakaraimas, that the village was um, under flood waters. It was reported that the entire village was flooded with water between 12 to 20 feet high. The village has a population of about 100 persons and requests was made for food and clothing. In the village of Waipa, um, the report was that the Tusha of that village reported that the approximately 95% of the village was flooded with water between 5 to 15 feet high. The village has a population of 329 persons and requests is also made for food and clothing. At Sand Hill, report was that it was underwater and the water was rising in the village. At Chidapau, the report from the chair, chairman there that 10 houses were halfway flooded and one was swept away. The population is about 591 persons and request was made here for food and clothing. It's important to know that some of these uh, communities are, are in valleys and therefore when the rains come down heavily, um, the waters come down from the mountains and they flood these villages. The Civil Defense Commission has been um, activated um, along with the Ghana Defense Force and the Regional Democratic Council for Regions 8 and 9. Um, an aircraft um, should have left to Mary at 11 o'clock today to have a first hand look and do a proper assessment as to what the true situation is. But I can say to you that Civil Defense Commission they have already started taking steps to get relief to those persons who are there. Again, the Defense Patrol is um, in a village not very far away from this, this, this area, and that patrol will also be having a look at what has happened there so that we can bring relief to the residents. Um, some of these floodwaters, basically, you just have to wait until they recede. There's not very much you can do except to provide for the comfort of the residents who are affected by it. And um, that is what the that's what we're doing. Um, my report is that the sky event should have left. In fact, the aircraft should have left much earlier this morning, but because of bad weather, the actual flight time had been pushed back. Um, later on today we will have a more accurate report as to what the situation is 
so that we can make other decisions. I can let you know also that His Excellency the President has been informed and advised of this situation and he has given certain directions to the Civil Defense Commission and to the regional administration about what actions should be taken and the support which the government is going to give to the residents who are affected by these floodings. That's one. Um, when you ask four and five questions, yes. <laughs> it becomes um, difficult to deal with all of them the, well, at the same time. How about GCOM? GCOM, the list, a list, a second list has been provided to His Excellency the President. And um, I can say to you, His Excellency is considering the list. Um, there was a consultation yesterday morning between His Excellency the President and the leader of the opposition. And uh, the matter was raised and the president gave the leader of the opposition the assurance that he's considering the list, and um, as soon as he has um, finished his consideration, he will get back to him. So um, there is no issue right now with a third list or a fourth list. We understand the, the patience of Guyanese that this is a matter which is of importance to them, and I can assure you that His Excellency is going to give it the urgency which the matter requires. Thanks. You had a... Tax and remittances by the United States, um, clearly that is going to affect, um, affect us. Um, as the same goes when certain people sneeze, everybody else catch a cold. Um, it's going to affect us, but that is if when the Americans uh, make the law, is what we have to do is to deal with the consequences of it. Um, what I think it means is that it will, be, it will cost you more to send money from the United States of America um, to Guyana. As you know, remittances has been a very a major plank in the sustenance of many uh, families in this country. And um, I think it's going to have an impact on them, but certainly we'll have to look and see what happens. Um, it might very well be that instead of getting $100, you get 90 In terms of considering any action? Well, there's nothing really that I believe that as a state here we can do about the way another country makes its laws. Um, all we can say is that, in, in fact, is encouraging people who send money to their residents, to their families here, is to increase the amount. <laughs> yes. Uh, good morning, Abino Alpha Sky Chain News. Um, just three questions. Uh, first, it has to do with GRE. Recently, GRE stopped an SUV with false number plate. Um, it was also an armor plated SUV. It was later found that this vehicle was released from the work without um, the relevant papers being perfected. Yes. However, GRA settled with BK um, and no other form of action was taken with regards to the side of the law. Um, your <laughs> government spoke of transparency and justice. Mm -hmm. Does this act course of action taken by GRA, is it a concern to you? And well, the government. That's one. Do you want me to go on? Or well, let me deal with that first. To say that um, the actions of GRA and the, on the Ministry of Finance, these are the competent authority in these matters. Um, they are the competent authorities in these matters, and therefore, whatever the actions that they have taken are actions that have been taken by, the, by those of that authority. They have basically made thousands of decisions like this and that never really came to cabinet's attention. And I can say to you that's not a matter that came to cabinet's attention. And therefore, I believe it is um, within the competence of those bodies to make the decisions that they make. Um, we will not go back and um, question it unless there has been some major concern or some major complaint made in relation to the decisions of those bodies. We've heard of um, some people have complained about decisions made in by the GRA in relation to taxes, in relation to customs, and things like that, but they are the competent authority. Okay. Thank you. Another thing, it was recently revealed that more money is to be spent on the Durban Park. Uh -huh. oh, park. Um, mm -hmm. Did cab Cabinet decide where this money is coming from and how much is to be spent? Well, no, it is not a matter that came to Cabinet, but I can say to you that all of these public facilities will require maintenance from time to time. All of them, and, and once they be, things are being used, they will have to be maintained, and maintenance sums, I believe, will have to be allocated for that. 
But that is not a matter that actually came to cabinet. Thank you, Mr. Harmon. Uh, one more question. Mm -hmm. uh, the foreign currency has been stabilized. Uh, and it has been reported that there is an excess in the system now. We know that the stabilization came because of um, actions taken by the relevant authorities, but has Cabinet been informed about a futuristic plan to avoid what has occurred about a month ago? Well, I think the Minister of Finance had made a very clear statement on this matter, and whether uh, the, the rates are up or down, it is stabilized, whether there is a spread, um, of, of interest and all of these things. I think these are matters which the Minister of um, Finance has dealt with. Um, as the Ministry has dealt with statements made concerning issues of GPL by the Leader of the Opposition, um, they are competent. In fact, we have every confidence in our Minister of Finance to be able to address these matters in a way that is going to come in here to the, to the benefit of all Guyanese. Yeah, and after that, I'll take one more. All right, yes. Minister, um, I read, I think I read something that the President might as well bypass the second list um, submitted by Mr. Jack Deal and appoint Ms. Justice Claudia for Bennett to the um, I think there's a, an answer in the newspapers today about that matter. Well, you have to read the newspaper, my friend. It's there. It's there. And if, in fact, the President has said that he is going to, first of all, consider this list before anything else is done. So there's no question of bypass and all of that right now. Yes. Uh, Minister Hartman, with respect. Well, I, see, I, see, I think that, okay, I'll take yours and then the last question I'll take from um, the lady um, that just came back from somewhere, who was at the back, Ms. Keanu Wilberg. Minister, with respect to the appointment of Mr. Patrick Yard as a member of the Public Service Commission, uh, what was the rationale for that appointment and uh, is the government concerned that there could be a, some uh, possible conflict of interest there because he's also the head of the public service union? And quickly, could you say what will be the monthly or annual cost of the advisors to the Minister of Legal Affairs and what was the rationale for those appointments? Well, that, that's two heavy questions to keep for the last. <laughs> First of all, um, Mr. Yard, at the time of his appointment, was a member of the Public Service Commission. With the uh, removal of office of Mr. Carville Duncan, the commissioners among themselves voted for him to be carrying out the functions of the chairman of that, of that entity. And that was to ensure that the business of the Public Service Commission continued. So that that was the, the process. It was a process of the commissioners themselves electing one from among their numbers to act as the chairperson. And that is the basis upon which the government took any further steps. <clears throat> That's one. The second... Um, Concerning the advisors... To the, the advisors to the yes, minister the of... The annual monthly cost and what was the rationale? Why did it become necessary? Well, you know, we have talent that's available in the country. And... When you have talent like that, there are people who have actually been in the system, who have actually served as judges, some as court of appeal judges and so on, and who have actually um, given their consent to act in that capacity. I think it is something that any government will take and hold with both hands immediately. Those persons actually volunteered their services and um, I don't know specifically what exactly the sum, but I'm sure it will just be a nominal sum for the advice which they will give. Yes, the last question from... Thank you, sir. Um, just two quick areas. The AFC said that it's interested in having a review of the Cummingsburg Accord. Is the APNU faction uh, very much open of this, welcoming of this, and are there areas within the Cummingsburg Accord which you would like to renegotiate? That's one. And two, sir, on another agonizing issue, the release of contracts. We, the members of the media have been asking for the release of contracts as it relates to Bai Shin Lin, Bai Tarn, the, on the Sinatra complex. And over and over we're being told that the contracts, that, 
they, they can be released, but then they're not being released. So where does the government really stand with this? How soon can members of the media expect the release of contracts? Okay, I think these questions you are asking, even before 2015 and going back um, about these contracts. I cannot say anything about it. It's not um, a matter which um, has been brought to the attention now of, of the government that these are contracts who are required. I'm sure if um, the appropriate authorities are written to it, because a lot of these contracts, you can't just ask for it and you get it. There's a process by which you get access to these contracts. Um, but I cannot specifically address the ones that you have, you have spoken about because the impact of these contracts have been widely reported in the same newspapers that you think which you're connected to. Um, but I cannot say with respect to the contracts um, why they're not released and, and where they are, but I believe if there are any contracts in that regard, it will have to be um, at the Ministry of Finance. That's where it should be. That's one. The second thing is, um, the other one is a political question. Well, political in the sense that it is not government. Now you're talking about a relationship between the APNU and the AFC. At the conference where I put on my APNU hat, I will answer that question. But for today, I'm wearing my hat as the Minister of State, and, um, and that is not a question that I can answer today. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Did you get any